Reverend Peter Pantagore, and I live in Maine. And in 1980, I had my first near-death experience. I was 21 years old. I was living in Bozeman, Montana as an exchange student at Montana State University. In the springtime, during spring break, I wanted I wanted not to go back to Boston, where I'm from, Boston, Massachusetts. I, I wanted to go on an adventure. And so I found an adventure to go on, and it was in British Columbia and Alberta. There was a man who had just finished his ice climbing certification as a leader, as a lead climber, and he was looking for a partner to go on a 10-day snow caving trip to Mount Assiniboine in British Columbia to ski in with 70-pound packs and to live in snow caves and find a couple of cabins and have this adventure and then to ski back out again and have a one-day ice climb. This was my first trip into the Canadian Rockies along the Icefields Parkway, which is was extraordinarily beautiful. One of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my entire life. We parked on the Icefields Parkway. There's a parking lot right across the street next to the Saskatchewan River. And we unloaded our gear and we walked over across the street, uh, the parkway into, hiked in maybe a uh, hundred yards, maybe, and it's not very far in. And there were 12 people climbing that day, maybe six other teams-ish. And they were already on their way up the climb. And we were the last. By the time we reached the top of the climb that night, five or 600 feet up, the sun was setting and everybody else who had been on the climb that day had left. And except for this final team and they were leaving. And we were sitting on this ledge. The sun goes down, the temperature drops 30 degrees, something like that instantaneously. Mm -hmm. It's cold, really cold suddenly, well below freezing. and hyperthermia sets in and this 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 team they, they're looking up at us like you guys must be crazy and off they go because it's they're going somewhere and now we're stuck on the cliff and we're in trouble immediately hyperthermia begins which it began with violent shivers all of my my muscles were independently pulsing from each other as we sat there with our 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 jaws clattering and our and our bodies like twitching like like crazy people like like uncontrollable uh some kind of uh i'm gonna remove that it's not like crazy people it's like having a seizure it's like having a seizure and all your muscles are all contracting and i'm not completely out of my own control and we have this conversation about this is deadly for us and what are we going to do we have to we have the three repels to get down in the dark while while we don't have any more food no more water our energies are, are low we're already in a hypothermic situation and we discussed spending the night right where we were because we also trusted each other neither of us i want to say neither of us lost our head at all through the night we all we both kept very level uh rational head as best as we could so the only choice we had was to try to fight our way down we fight our way down all night long Hypothermia continues to increase. We continue to deplete our energy. It keeps getting colder. We finally reach the last repel. And now it's sometime before dawn, couple, three hours. I don't really know because I didn't have a watch on and I really didn't care what time it was. All I cared about was every single action I was taking to survive because every step we took depleted our energy. Every move I made, every word I said depleted my energy level. And I had no, I had no excess fat on my body. I was, my body was consuming itself as it was freezing. So now this is the, I'll set up this last thing, this last repel. We had just descended down this dark crag and the moon had come up like a three quarter so we could see better. And we had, we were off the ice. We descend down this, this corner in this kind of craggy area where it's uh, shadow cast. So we can't see very well. And at the top of this, there was an iron pin and the iron pin was epoxied into the mountain with a ring on it, an O ring on it, through which the rope was hung. And we both, this Tim descended down first and I descended second. And we get to this corner and we kind of go around this corner onto this ledge. And the ledge is the size of a kitchen table, twice, twice the size of a kitchen table. And, and in front of us were these iron pins epoxied in the mountain with iron rings and carabiners and straps with a carabiner so we could hook into the mountain. So, because this is the this is the top, the bottom rappel. It's also the one people use to practice climbing on. I mean, there was a 500 foot drop next to us. 
all night long, one slip. So we, we, the cold wasn't just killing us. It was every step we had to take with care and caution so we didn't fall. So now we're safe. We're clipped into the mountain. The shivering had stopped because we'd gone beyond that stage. And I had the rope. I tied the rope to the to uh, my harness, one end, and I took the other end, and I tossed it out around the side, and I pulled the rope, and within the first moment of pulling the rope, it jammed in a, in a crag around the other side of this curve of the rock. So I couldn't, I couldn't flip the line to get it out of the crevice, because every time I flipped the line, the flip would just stop at the end of the curve where, it was, where the rope was laying on the mountain. I couldn't reascend the rope because I only had one side of it. And I couldn't climb back up um, as if I was uh, rock climbing because I had mountain boots on and frozen feet and crampons, not any way to climb. And I, and I, in my hands, I couldn't grip rock. My hands to tie the rope took an immense amount of concentration because one of the things that was happening to me is my muscles were freezing. It was difficult to move my lips to speak. It was difficult to move my hands. My brain had become fogged by cold. I lost a lot of my capacity for reasoning, for thinking things through. I began to make poor decisions through the night. We, we made several poor decisions. The rope is stuck. Tim is to my left. We're freezing to death. I can't get the rope free. I keep pulling on it. There's no way I can get it loose. There's nothing we can do. And at that point, uh, peace settled over me and this drive for survival evaporated and so did my fear it just all went away i came to this realization that there was no way out of this i was going to die here and so i started looking around at this great beauty and the bazillions of stars in the sky all these different colors and sizes it is an extraordinarily beautiful sky and I could see there was so much light that I could see, I could see the, the the mountains across the river. I could hear the river all night, the rippling of the river as, the, as it as it flowed down. And so there's this soundtrack. And I started listening to the river. I started listening to the river as I was feeling my my way into this imminent death. And then I began to fall asleep. And I would kept pulling on the rope, but the more I pulled, the tighter the jam. I'd fall asleep. My, it was like a curtain dropping. Boom, this curtain drops. It's darkness. My, I, I lose consciousness. I fall to the, to the stone of the ledge and, you know, smack my shoulder, whack my head. I got a helmet on, whack my head and wake back up again. And, you know, oh, I must be falling asleep and I stand back up. And I'm still trying to pull the rope to get out of there, pull the rope again. And, but the exhaustion was so extreme that sleep would come in a snap of a finger. Boom, sleep would come and I'd be down. I'd be back up again, pulling on the rope. And then I stood up this last time. And I stood up this last time. And, and, and my, I had this peripheral vision. My vision became a tunnel. And there was this big black circle around my vision that I had never seen before. Maybe out and I just put your arms out, extend that, this, this blackness is at your fingertips. And it's this big dark circle. And this dark circle starts to close very rapidly. And I started looking around and, and everything got narrower and narrower and narrower until I, I was looking right at the mountain and it went, as it went like this to darkness, I thought to myself, I must be falling asleep again, but I'd never seen anything like it. And as it went to nothing, it didn't fall asleep. And I was surprised. I was, oh, I, I, why am I not asleep? What? And now I'm not in pain. And I was wondering, well, where am I? What is this? I, 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 I it was the mountain in front. Am I lying down? Am I, st I don't know. I'm sort of floating. And in front of me where the mountain had been, there, well, there was like a barrier. I was, I was on a, there was a barrier and then there was this incredibly deep and dark distant void. And this void was all darkness. And as I stared into this darkness, as if it had been that curtain falling, as I stared into this darkness, way far in the distance, a, a galact, a galaxy, galaxy away, you know, 10 galaxies away. There's no, imagine no stars in the sky. And it's just completely black. And then suddenly uh, a hundred billion light years away, a pinprick of light appeared one pinprick of light that illuminated the whole scene and it rushed toward me across this distance 
with a speed that, I, that is incalculable. And, and as it came toward me, it, it filled my vision and it spoke to me but not in language there were no there was no words here this was non-linguistic data download of information all at once and what it communicated to me was i you're coming with me i'm i'm here to take you i'm taking you and 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 as it came to me i i resisted i was like i'm not sure what's going on here but i'm not going anywhere so i kind of put up this willpower against it uh, this this barrier i tried this very thin weak barrier uh, and 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 as i put this up it just uh, it's right at me now it's all happened so fast it it just took me it, it re reached through my barrier as if it was made of nothing and and i am now inside of this entity and i i know this entity this is not this entity is not unknown to me when i was a child this same angelic being this ball of intelligence had come to me several times. So I, I am not afraid. I have no fear at all. I, I know this being and it is ginormous. It's, it's so huge compared to me and I'm inside of it. I, I, it was like being in on a cloud bed, but the cloud bed surrounded me and I had no agency. I had no power to move my body and I had a body, but my body was not physical. My, I could see my body. My body was, energetic it was made of light these are all metaphors i can't i can't tell you exactly what it was because there's no language for this but i still had a shape and my shape was more or less human but i wasn't me anymore and i had no brain anymore i was this energy being who i knew i was inside this much larger light being and this larger light being call, call it an angel if you want to uh, i uh, it was the divine presence it was God and, and it, it was infilling me. It was speaking to me as, a, as I was inside it, speaking comfort and, and welcome and power and intelligence. It was showing its intelligence. It was showing its power to me. It's showing its comfort to me. And, and I'm inside of this and I can see through it into the void. I see there's an edge to this entity and I see that there's darkness beyond it, and we are traveling back up the route that it had come down. Call it a tunnel, an elevator, or a highway, a railroad line, whatever it is that we're traveling the same route. And I am superpositioned. I am inside this entity feeling only comfort, only well-being, and I am also outside. I am outside, seeing myself inside, seeing this angelic form, traveling along a parallel route. I have like an eyeball out there, but I have no location out there. I have no, I don't even have a light body. I am just seeing this with no locus. And, and as I was traveling up inside of this entity, we reached back to the point where it had first emerged from wherever it had come from into this darkness and it I, it maybe it opened itself or our eye popped out of it or i i'm not really sure exactly what happened all i know is that it it suddenly i was inside a different darkness and as i am there suddenly there's an opening in the darkness and the darkness opens into a brilliant light. It's like a, a, a ripping or a door opening or a waterfall suddenly turning on. There's this light energy and this light energy is ginormous. I am ginormous. I am 10,000 times bigger than a human being. And this dwarfed me and the infinite space I was in dwarfed it. But this light, this flow, it's, it was, it was like a, a, a pearlescent illumination where every color that I had seen in the night sky and all the different sizes of the stars, that, that's what amazed me up there. And so far from the light pollution on a super dark night, I could see the size difference with my naked eye of the, of the suns of the stars and their colors were so many colors I had never seen before. And on this pearlescent flow, all of that, individual colors of light that I had never seen before, but 
but all colors, like millions of colors that I x-rays and infrared and ultraviolet and all of these permutations of the electromagnetic energy, but not electromagnetic energy, so much more than that. So many more colors, so much more energy. And there was this flow to it. And it was the most beautiful, attractive, seductive, desirous that I'd ever encountered. It called to me. And as it called to me, I went to it. And as I went to it, I wanted it. And I could see its surface, like this flowing surface. I could see its depth. And I could see through it. So it was like solid and translucent and transparent all at the same time, simultaneously. And, and as I looked through it, there was the, this deeper, darker tunnel. I'm inside this entity and it's inside of me and it shows me myself. It shows me my human self. I see my entire life. I have a life review and, and it's not like I'm watching a movie sitting in the theater. I'm experiencing all of the pain that I ever gave away in my life in a sequence from the interior of all of these other people in my life. And as I went through all of the sequence of the pain that I caused in my life, I was simultaneously superpositioned back inside my own brain and emotions and psychology and all the reasons that I had created this selfish action for intentionally causing them pain. I had all of my understanding and all of my reasons and feelings were minuscule in comparison to this massive amount of pain that I caused. My anger, my jealousy, whatever it was, uh, the pain that I gave was disproportionate to the amount of suffering that had caused me to give it. And I judged myself as guilty for having caused all of this pain to all of these people for my tiny, tiny reasons. Because also it was showing me love. It was showing me this divine infinity, this purity, this unlimitedness, this unmanifestedness, this thing that is so far beyond my soulful comprehension of it without even my brain. I still couldn't understand the depth of its love. And as it showed me myself, it was a, I describe it as a, a hell, but I also describe it as a divine fire of purgative love because it was a cleansing for me. I was cleansed. All of the, all of the chaff was burned off of my wheat. I was cleansed to the core of my being and I had nothing left of me except my original self. And as I judged myself guilty, as my sins came down on me, as my karma came down on me, I listened to the love that was being spoken to me. And as I heard the love being spoken to me, I saw all of humanity's brokenness. I saw this radical equality of my brokenness as a human being being the same as everyone else's brokenness. And that it wasn't one morality above another morality. It wasn't, I'm better than another person because I didn't do that thing that I think you did that's heinous in my mind. In comparison to infinity, there was, it was like standing on the moon and looking at the earth and seeing a smooth ball instead of being on the earth and seeing the mountain peaks and the valleys. From where I was, there was only one comparison. And it wasn't to humanity, it was to the divine infinity and everything else was less than. And so it created in me an understanding of my own limitedness. And as I saw my limitedness in the sort of being in the, a created being in the matrix of the, of the universe that we live inside of, of materialism, of material and photons and, and muons and molecules and stars, as human beings, I saw that all of that was constructed. I understood the created nature of creation. In the moment, I wanted to understand how everything was put together. I could see how the universe was made. And my brokenness as a little tiny human being was no different 
than all of the limitation that made the universe exist. No limitation, no universe. In comparison to the unlimited purity of all there was, the whole universe is a shattered place, me included. And as I saw this, as I was shown this, I understood that it was not me that sinned. Yes, I made those choices. Yes, I hurt those people. And that hurt was real and I carried it with me. And I wasn't allowed to bring it with me into the divine place. There was no room for anything that, that remained of the material world. I didn't make the universe. I was just a part of it. And the divine love was speaking to me forgiveness and mercy and welcome and healing and wholeness and peace and bliss and awe and understanding and knowledge and presence and light and love and beauty. And I could see this and hear it through, through the lens of the, of the love that I was in my own origin and the love that had been given to me in my life by those who loved me and those who I loved in my life. All of the love I had given away accrued to me. All of the pain I gave away accrued to me. And as I listened through the ear of my heart to the love that was being spoken, all of this forgiveness that had always been there waiting, always present, it wasn't newly on the table. It's the divine being itself. So I see inside myself, I then sh I'm back to my, to, uh, to this capacity of looking back into my most recent human life. And I say, is this death? Am I dead? And the voice says to me, yes, you're dead. This is death. And I say, cause I can see the pain of my parents behind me. I say, but my parents, they're going to lose me. So I have now a, a resurgence of my last thoughts as a human being, thinking of my parents losing me. And I still have this part of me. And I say, do I have to stay? And the voice says, your time is now come home. I said, but my parents are suffering. And, and it took me and this is I say this with language, but there's no language here. There's no words. I'm swept across. It's like it's it, it takes a hand and it sweeps me across itself like across the universe, but it's inside itself to the edge of itself of this vast, vast darkness at a speed I can't tell you it. it I just can't tell you how fast. And I get to the edge of this heaven that I'm inside of. And my consciousness is pushed outside of this heaven. Some percentage of me, 10% of me, 90% of me still inside the divine. But this 10% that's now outside the heaven, I'm in our universe. And I can see all of our universe. I can see all of the galaxies. I, and there, there's huge space between them. And my attention is brought back to in time in in universal time, back to the origin of the universe. And I see the universe in its origin, but it's not at the Big Bang. It's as it's being manifested. I see it's it's constant manifestation. And there's a point at which I cannot see beyond. And it was at this point where where the infinite in itself begins that there's this outpouring of love and this love of it, it which is itself which is in, in inexpressible to me i can't tell you it, it it pervades everything that is the whole universe is pouring out woven inside of this love and this love is woven inside of it. And it's not just our universe pouring out. It's universe after universe after universe. It's all of these, these constant unfoldings, hundreds of them, thousands of them, just love unfolding into all of these, these presences of the divine self manifested into limited form, unlimited becoming limited, universe after universe after universe. And it's all love. I see earth 
and I see like a hologram, I see 7 billion people all at once. And I can look in on them and see individuals, but I see them all together too. And inside of every single one of them is this golden fleck of light, like a gold, like gold dust of light, like a speck of golden light. And nobody can see it in anybody else. I can see it from where I am. And the whole world, the whole earth is covered with this foam. that's like a fog through which they can't see the light. And I, I see wars, I see births, I see murders, I see crime, I see love, I see babies being born, I see mundane, I see all the human things in real time of what's, of while I'm dead, I see these living human beings and every one of them is as beloved as me. I am the most beloved and so is everyone else. And there is no paradox in this. There is only the divine self. And, and I understand my eternal welcome, that I am always welcomed and that everyone is always welcomed and that everyone is always made of this divine love. At the core of our beings, there is no separation from the oneness of being. All go home because there is nowhere else to go. And the voice says to me, so now you know you don't have to go back because now you understand timelessness and time. And in a moment, they'll be through their life and here, back with me again, back in this joy and this light and this welcome and this wholeness where there is no suffering. So you don't have to go back but you get to choose. And now I understand the own temporality of my own human life. Snap of a finger, live, die, snap in between. I say, I choose to live my life. And it says to me, you won't live your life. And snaps me off its fingertip and shoots me back across this this heaven and this heaven gets denser and denser and denser and I become more and more material and it's escorting me. It's the angelic form of the divine escorting me, carrying me back. And as I go, I get thicker and thicker and thicker. And, and in front of me, there's a million doorways. And all these doorways are set up like a like petals on a flower. And they're just petal and petal and petal and all of them are doorways. And in the center of this flower is, is divine light. And, and these doorways, they have surface to them, but this divine light, it comes from behind me. It's like this power that comes from this heaven behind me. And it, and it, and it comes into the, the center of the flower and it radiates out into in, to decreasing light to the furthest edges. And, and it is the power of their existence. And the voice says to me inside of me, choose light, choose. And, and, and it, it, it shows me itself, but I have choice and I'm denser and denser more and more. I'm back in my light body again, and I'm back in my light body again with this sort of humanoid form. And I see all of these doors and I, and I, and I see the light and I want the light. The light is all I want, but I want some humanness. And now I'm dense again, and I'm out on the other side of this tunnel, and I'm at my body, and I see my body. I see my body, I'm suddenly up close to my body, and I see my body, and I'm sort of half off the cliff, harnessed in, and, and I see the, this angelic form tears a hole in my chest, like a rip, and pulls it open, and and I'm watching this happen and I still can see behind me. I can see the divine behind me, but it's much duller now and quieter now and not as present to me now. And then this, I felt like I was being screwed into my body very painfully, very slowly screwed into this hole. Like I didn't quite fit. I was still too big and I had to be shoved and condensed even further to fit inside this teeny tiny thing. And I'm inside this teeny tiny thing. And I, and I, and I see my hole, I see the hole and by heart and I'm looking out and it closes. And as it closes, now I'm imprisoned. I'm imprisoned. And as I'm imprisoned, I'm fuel trapped. 
and my I feel my brain come back online like a, a it feels like a whirring up like an kind of coming up at speed coming up to speed coming up to speed and and as it comes up to speed all I feel is pain and and as my brain comes back online I begin to hear and I hear sounds and I and I don't know what it is and they resolve as my brain comes stronger and stronger they resolve into a voice and the voice is screaming and it's shouting and I hear words and the words are don't die don't die don't you can't be dead don't die come back don't die and it's screaming and it's crying and it's yelling and in harsh tones and and I open my eyes and and I see now I see a body and I see an arm reaching down to me and fear on this face and I see but I don't know who this is and and it and, and now it's like you're alive you were dead and he's pulling me up he's yanking me up you were dead I thought you were dead I thought you were dead and he's crying and I'm like what is going on here why am I in pain where was I who am I what am I where was I what is this place I have no idea what's going on and and my brain comes continues to come back and come back and I begin to remember oh, I'm on a mountainside. Oh, this is Tim. I've been ice climbing. I died. But wh where was I? Where had I gone? I had been somewhere. But my brain couldn't grasp it. I no longer had the understanding that I had on the other side. But I knew that I was entirely different because now the world physically looked different to me. I could see Tim. As a human being, I could see the rock in front of me. I could see myself as a human being, but it was flat, two-dimensional, black and white, flickering, broken, less than. And, and through it all, there was this immediate perception of light also. So in Tim, in the darkness, there was all this light, but the light was hidden underneath this darkness. But I could see it and it, and it made the darkness look thin and weak and and ugly to me only the light had beauty to me and 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 Tim said pull the rope because this time I I may have I think I fall I had fallen further off the cliff because I saw my body dangling a little and I pull myself back up uh, pardon me I, I I pull in the rope I'm standing up by this point I pull in the rope because he tells me to and the rope comes free and I pull it down and he helps me pull it and we put it through one of the, the ring, he puts it through his ring, he clips into it, he descends down to the bottom, I follow him down, we pop open the tent, we treat ourselves for hypothermia and then I'm a different person. I'm in a new world and I don't know who I am anymore and he's treating me as if I had been this other person, but I wasn't anymore, I didn't know who I was. and. And then my life completely changed. I, well, I live a, as a born again person. It has an entirely different meaning to me now. And so the primary change in my life was that I no longer had an external pursuit. I had an internal pursuit and, I, and, 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 a, and a desire for my beloved, for whom I was bereft. They say that separation makes the heart grow fonder i was desperate for this because this was the only reality that was real to me this place here was not 